Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, when I was a little kid, my dad always told me that if I started to dig a hole, I would end up in China. But in reality, I would end up in New Zealand because it's exactly on the opposite side of, of the Earth. Anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, in my presentation this afternoon, I am going to talk about the format for transfer of digital records uh, that we use at the National Archives in Denmark. And I, was all, I will always also give you a general overview of how we handle digital records. First, I should probably mention that Danish does not really have a word for records, not in the same sense as English records. So what I mean when I say records is really all the information that we get from uh, agencies, all the information that is transferred to us will be covered by the word our records. I should also mention that yesterday I heard Ross from the UK National Archives say that uh, formal obsolescence is really not anything they worry too much about uh, at the UK National Archives. And I thought that was really, really uh, interesting and quite an eye-opener because the very foundation of almost everything I will say to you this afternoon is the basic notion that format obsolescence is the single biggest threat to digital uh, preservation. So it's quite interesting to see how we can have really different um, uh, perspectives on that. Some of the main points in our setup for digital records are that state agencies must notify the National Archives on all new systems uh, that they implement, both records management systems and other IT systems. Uh, records management systems cannot be taken into use before the National Archives has approved of the implementation. It's also the National Archives that decides uh, when the transfer must take place, and we don't really care about retention periods and document life cycle uh, and things like that in the digital world, again, because uh, we don't want to see any form of obsolescence. The transfers must take place uh, in the form of system independent submission information packages. And only a few formats are allowed for the transfers. And there are very specific rules for structure and documentation. The conversion to archive formats must be performed by and of course also at the expense of the records creator. Uh, and all submission information packages are tested before they are approved of and any necessary corrections must be made by the records creator. A few facts about uh, what we do in the field of digital um, records. We receive every year between 200 and 400 submission information packages of born digital records. Uh, we have currently about 4,000 uh, packages in our archive, each of which represents one transfer from a database. Many of these transfers consist of data from databases without documents, but of course we also receive an increasing number of systems uh, where there are digital documents included. Fully digital records management has been allowed by the National Archives since 1996, and obviously today an overwhelming majority of our agencies uh, have gone completely digital and do not produce any paper records anymore. The amount of born digital uh, material in our collection is now about 30 terabytes, and half of that has been received over the past two years. So that gives you kind of an idea of how the curve looks for us uh, right now. So the amount is growing uh, rapidly. In order for us to make sure that all the digital records, all the digital information, that should be preserved will in fact be transferred to us at the National Archives. We must know what systems the agencies use and then determine which systems contain information that we want to preserve. So we have regulations for notification on all systems and approval of system with documents. At the time of appraisal, or approval, a date for the first transfer is set, and usually when the system has been in operation for five years. The approval of records management systems has nothing to do with whether they are good records management systems or not. The only thing we look at is whether we believe that it would be possible to create a submission information package according to our standards based on the implementation of the system. 
we do not certify certain systems because a good system can be implemented in uh, a way that is not adequate for archival purposes and vice versa. And we also think that it is a really good thing that we are in contact with the agencies when they implement new systems, even if it's a system that we know well from other agencies. Our experience is that in many cases, the process of transfer five years later will be easier if the question of transfer has been discussed already at the time of implementation. So I was very pleased with the theme of this uh, conference, Digital Preservation by Design, because we think that the sooner we make the agencies think about uh, transfer of the digital records uh, for long-term preservation, the better. We are currently working on revised regulation that will al also enable us to approve of any other types of system, not only the records management systems, because Many of the uh, challenges are the same, whether the system contains documents uh, or not. Now that has to go through a public hearing, so we don't really know how that will end, but hopefully sometime this year, we will extend this uh, procedure of approval to all systems that contain information that should be preserved. At the time of transfer, the National Archives initiates a meeting with the records creator in preparation of the transfer. And there we discuss the selection of tables, the documentation, and a more ti detailed timetable. However, of course, the actual production of the submission information package is the responsibility of the agency. They can do it themselves, they can use the vendor who sold them the IT system, or they can hire another consultant that's their own business. It's not the responsibility of the National Archives. We have a very specific uh, standard for the structure, the content, and the formats in a submission information package, and it has been um, issued as an executive order. I heard yesterday about guidelines for transfer, which is very common. Um, we believe in tough legislative power, so we have an executive uh, order. And this uh, standard specifies a generic uh, submission information package that must be used for all transfers no matter if they come from a records management system or any other type of system. Our strategy for long-term preservation only allows for the preservation of relational databases, no matter if the system in question is a business system or a records management system uh, or something else. If a system is not a relational database, it must be converted into one before the transfer to the archives takes place. That is also true for, for instance, uh, collections of documents found in a folder structure. In that case, the folder structure must be converted into one or more tables before transfer. Even if you have old audio or video tapes, you must first digitize the content and put the content in the same structure as everything else before you can transfer it to the archives. Archiving the content from databases, even from records management systems, allow us to keep the same metadata about the files and documents as the, records creating, uh, the record creating agency in question found important for themselves, rather than to set up a specific standard for mandatory metadata. We believe that the records creators should use the metadata that they need for their business purposes rather than the metadata that we can think of at the National Archives. Our job is to preserve the evidence of business of government, not to tell government how to perform its business. <coughs> As archival formats for documents, we have chosen TIFF and JPEG 2000 for our office documents, pictures, drawings, maps, etc. MP3 for sound, MPEG-2 or MPEG-4 for video, and GML according to the ISO standard uh, for geographical information. Up until 2010, we have not been able to receive transfers of uh, geographical information. And there was a reason for worry for a long time because we saw how government agencies, and especially on the local and regional level, put a lot of files from uh, geographical information systems into their records management systems where they served as uh, an important part of the documentation for a certain decision 
for instance, whether to allow a new building, an extension of a building, or any other change of the physical environment. But we got the ISO standard for GML, and um, the Danish authorities implemented it in a Danish version, so that was really easy for us to also pick that as a preservation format. Now, the format uh, on the slide and I, that I just mentioned is, of course, not necessarily a checklist of the right formats to choose if you believe in normalization at the time of transfer. But just to give you an idea of the formats that we have chosen. And obviously, it's a very limited uh, list, and that's based on the fact that if we want a solution for transfer, preservation, and dissemination of digital records uh, in full scale, that is also economically feasible, um, and where as many processes as possible can be automated, it's critical to keep complexity down. So in order to keep the costs of monitoring conversions as low as possible, we only use a few well-defined formats for preservation. Data from the tables are exported in XML in a Danish version of the Swiss SIAT format. Uh, that acronym stands for Software Independent Archiving of Relational Databases uh, developed by the Swiss Federal Archives. The standardized SIP submission information package look, looks like this, and it consists of the following main components. The tables, the documents, if applicable, that is, if the system in question had any documents in it, context, documentation, indices, and schemas. This one is not uh, a drawing that I made specifically for this conference because we actually chose English names for the main components and folders, um, primarily because we have incorporated parts of the SIAT format and we didn't really feel that it was necessary to create a Danish translation of it. Uh, and then it would be really strange to have some parts in Danish and some parts in English. So we ended up choosing English names, and that also, of course, facilitates the exchange of um, knowledge with archives outside of Denmark. So that's a good thing. The core content of the SIP is, of course, found in the tables folder, folder with the actual data and the documents folder with the actual documents from the IT system in question. The tables folder contain the tables from the database that we want to preserve. Usually we take all tables, but in some cases uh, the archivist picks out uh, certain tables uh, to be uh, disposed of. The content of each table is found in an XML file, and it has to be accompanied by a schema that defines the structure. And this structure is uh, modeled after the CIAT format. Now the CIAT format is sort of a standard, but and I feel really bad about this, we of course uh, made some alterations to that uh, standard because we needed something in the SEAT format that wasn't there, and we felt that the SEAT format probably included a little more than we really needed. So I confess we made alterations uh, to the SEAT format in the Danish implementation of it. Uh, one of the things that we did was to uh, take the documents out in a separate structure in the SEAT format the idea is to keep uh, the documents as binary objects in the XML file, but we want to take them out in a structure for themselves because it is so important for us to make sure that all documents have been converted to the right formats uh, and that we can test and check that uh, at the time of transfer. The documents folder contains documents from the IT system uh, in itself as opposed to documents that have been included in the SIP for archival purposes. A document can consist of either a single file or more, for example, if the document is a multiple page TIFF document, but we do not allow for mixed documents where you have one part as a TIFF file and the other part as a sound file, then you must uh, split it in two different documents and put them in uh, separate folders. Again, we have tried to make a structure that makes it easy to do things as automated as possible, and all kinds of variations uh, should be avoided as, uh, to as far as an extent as possible. 
In the context documentation folder, we have documents that have been included specifically for archival purposes. If you have what we call system independent archiving, you export data and documents from a system. And if a future user should be able to understand the context in which data and documents were created, you need to include some information that can help uh, him or her uh, in that task. That could be, for instance, documentation about the administrative use, a user manual, uh, a guide, uh, maybe some screenshots, information about the purpose and content and technical structure of the system, uh, and also a documentation of the transformation from uh, the system and into the uh, submission information package. We also add a few pieces of information ourselves if we feel that there has been uh, issues in the test process that we want to document for posterity, we can also include that uh, kind of documents in the context documentation folder. The uh, indices folder contain uh, a number of uh, XML files to help uh, figure out uh, how to understand the information in the submission information package. The archive index is an XML file where you have basic information about the record's creator, the time in which data was created, uh, what kind of identifiers you uh, could find in the data, etc. We have a doc index with an index of all documents, uh, a documentation index, which has now been renamed to context documentation index, um, where uh, you have an index of, uh, of those files. <clears throat> and which category they pertain to. And in the file index, we have a total list of all files in the SIP. Here, we include a checksum for each file. And the idea is, of course, that this checksum will help us determine whether something has gone wrong, either during transport or the ingest into our system. Because we can see that if the checksum differs from what has been registered here in uh, the file index, <clears throat> something uh, has probably gone wrong. wrong. Now, the checksum is, of course, not a guarantee that data or documents is an authentic representation of what was in the system that produced it, but at least it helps us realize if something has gone wrong in the process of transfer and ingest. And we keep the checksums, of course, throughout uh, our archives, so we can always use the checksums um, to see if some, something has gone wrong in any process. In the table index, we have information about the uh, tables and fields in the tables. That's the information you need when you want to recreate the database uh, uh, in, uh, in some sort of um, system to make things accessible for the user. And then we have a, a schemas folder <clears throat> where you have standard schemas that are universal for all submission information packages. Uh, schemas for the index files and uh, W3C uh, XML schema and also some GML schemas if you have uh, geographical information in your package. Once a submission information package has been produced, it is transferred to us at the National Archives. At this point, unfortunately, via portable media, not the internet. There are a number of issues, both in terms of security authentication and not least performance that needs to be resolved before we can, uh, we can uh, receive transfers over the internet. Some of the uh, submission information packages that we get at the moment uh, can be one terabyte or more, so it would be quite a challenge to receive that amount of data over the net. But eventually, hopefully sometime over the next couple of years, this is one of the things that we are working on. Uh, because there would be such an improvement for the agencies that they can just send things to us over the net. We test the submission information package both automatically and manually. The automated test deals with things like formats, compression, structure, character encoding, checksums. Uh, and then we have a manual test uh, where we check the things that require a human eye. It could be things like is the documentation correct and as agreed upon? Does the submission information package contain all the relevant tables, etc.? Of course, it also requires a human eye 
to analyze the results from the automated test and try to communicate that result back to the records creator. All the necessary corrections must be done by the records creator, so sometimes a submission information package has to go back and forth between us and the records creator several times uh, before we can finally approve of it. I think our record is uh, a process that took seven years from the first transfer until we uh, finally approved of this particular submission information package. That is not the norm, though. <clears throat> The test tool that we use for our automated test is available uh, for download on our web page, so records creators have uh, a chance to uh, run a, sort of a structural test of their uh, uh, submission information package before they transfer it to us. This standard uh, that I have just described is a national standard in the sense that all public digital records must be transferred to an archive according to this standard. State agencies must transfer their records to the National Archives at the times where we decide, whereas the municipalities can choose between establishing their own city or a municipality archive uh, or transfer the records to the National Archives. But the point is that all public records, no matter if they're transferred to us or another public archive, must be transferred according to this particular standard. As a small country with limited resources, we must make sure that digital preservation is done cost-effectively and at the same time as securely as possible. So we feel that one standard for public records uh, has really been beneficial for us um, in terms of making sure that we can share experiences, tools, and procedures across all the archives that receive transfers. For the record, there are, of course, digital preservation outside of the archives at the libraries, etc., and they have uh, their own solutions that are not covered by this uh, standard. It's also a national standard in the sense that even though we have based uh, the core of the submission information package on the CIAT format, uh, we have uh, made some alterations, and we have not designed the SIP according to other standards like PREMIS or METS. However, we are really open to the possibility of finding a common preservation format for databases, and that is an agenda that we, at the moment, are trying to push on a European level. The CIAT format, the Danish adaption of it, as well as the Portuguese DBML format could easily be combined into one standard format for database preservation based on SQL 99 and XML. I would say that we have a solution for digital preservation that works. Um, millions of documents and content from thousands of databases have been converted to standard archival formats and are now preserved and will, be ena will, will enable future historians and researchers to tell the story about Denmark in the late 20th and early 21st century. The system was built gradually uh, in the 90s and has been in place since 2000. The format uh, has changed a little bit with the uh, introduction of CIAT-based XML, but all the basic principles have remained the same for the past 12 years. However, there is quite a bit of old-fashioned Viking brutality in this uh, strict conversion to a limited number of standard formats, and it always raises the question about the preservation of significant properties and the preservation of complex digital objects that are um, inherently digital, as Jeff uh, Rothenberg told about yesterday, and that cannot be represented by 2D graphics or tables in a relational database. So we are very well aware of the fact that having a solution that works is not the end of the story in digital preservation. It works for now, but we always have to look for better ways to make sure that today's digital information will also be available tomorrow. Thank you for your attention.